Currently, a Grindus holds the largest registered herd in Brazil. We have approximately 1,950 cows in lactation. Here, there are 200 beds on each side, and we operate with one animal per bed. The maximum stocking rate is 100% bed occupancy to increase the likelihood of cows lying down and staying down longer. And the total herd, including cows and heifers, is 5,300 animals. The daily milk production is 65,000 liters. We carry out three feedings per day. All the forage is produced on the farm, including both corn silage and a secondary forage source. Jesse sent a message saying that he won't be making videos anymore because you haven't subscribed to the Santa Fe channel. So subscribe now, and he will continue recording on farms around the world. My name is Alexandre, and I'm the general manager here at Fazenda Agrindus. This is a free stall barn, where the cows are housed on sand beds with individual dividers. We maintain a maximum occupancy of one animal per stall, ensuring maximum comfort and more time lying down. We implement a total mixed ration, TMR. All dietary components are mixed so that each bite delivers a balanced portion of all nutrients. We feed three times per day. All forage is produced on site, including corn silage and a secondary source, which varies with the season. Tifton grass, oats, millet, or sorghum. Barn cleaning is performed using a flush system, supplemented by one mechanical scraping per day. All manure flows into a central gutter under the freestall barn and undergoes a three-stage separation process. First, the sand is removed through a settling lane and then reused as bedding. Second, the solid fraction of the manure is separated using a static screen. This solid material is composted and later used on silage fields. Third, the liquid fraction is applied as fertilizer, both on corn silage fields and Tifton pastures. Here, we use a total mixed ration system, in which all ingredients are blended in feed wagons, specifically designed for this purpose. This ensures that each mouthful is nutritionally balanced. All forage is produced on the farm, including corn silage and a seasonal forage crop, typically Tifton grass, oats, millet, or sorghum. Other dietary ingredients are purchased externally and are mainly agro-industrial byproducts. Citrus pulp from the juice industry, cottonseed from the textile industry, soybean meal, DDG, dried distillers grains, a byproduct from corn ethanol production, corn grain, and a mineral premix tailored to each animal category. We perform three feedings per day and at least 10 feed push-ups to stimulate intake and improve feed accessibility. Our heat stress mitigation strategy focuses on barn architecture. The roof slope promotes air circulation as hot air is less dense and naturally rises, a phenomenon known as the chimney effect. This is why we have an open ridge cap to help expel hot air. Sand bedding offers superior thermal regulation compared to other materials, enhancing cow comfort. We also operate a sprinkler system on a two-minute on, three-minute off cycle. What truly cools the cow is evaporation, not simply wetting her. To complete the process, we employ ventilation, which enhances evaporative cooling and ensures effective thermal comfort. For us, sand bedding is an excellent choice, especially given our proximity to the ceramics industry. We source ceramic byproduct sand, rather than extracting sand from rivers or quarries. This makes the material more sustainable, as it is recycled industrial waste rather than freshly mined aggregate. We recover sand through a settling lane and after drying, it is turned several times to accelerate the breakdown of organic residues. Then it is reused as bedding. The space between stalls is 1.25 meters. Sand is replenished weekly, the stalls are cleaned three times per day, and lime is applied twice per week to the rear third of the bed to control microorganisms, protect udder health, and reduce mastitis risk. 
Today, a Grindis holds the largest registered dairy herd in Brazil, and the largest A2 herd as well. 100% of our animals are A2, A2 homozygos. We currently have about 1,950 cows in lactation, with a total herd of approximately 5,300 animals, including cows and heifers. Our daily milk production reaches 65,000 liters. The dairy herd structure is divided into five distinct sectors. The first sector is the maternity area, where heifers and cows give birth and receive initial postpartum care. Newborn heifers enter phase one, which is the milk feeding phase. At around 83 days, they are weaned and moved to phase two, the growth phase, which lasts from 82 days to approximately one year of age. Then they proceed to phase three, the reproductive phase where they are inseminated and once pregnant, return to the maternity sector for calving. That's the complete young stock cycle here on the farm. Cows that calve in the maternity area and begin lactation are moved to the crystal production unit, which operates a double 3060 milking system, meaning 60 animals are milked simultaneously. We also have a centralized feeding sector that serves all five dairy cattle divisions, including rearing, maternity, and production. We operate with three feed wagons, two horizontal mixers, and one vertical mixer. The concentrate is loaded first, followed by the forages, which include grass and corn silage. Feeds are stored in individual boxes, each properly labeled. A wheel loader handles loading, and each wagon is programmed with predefined slots to deliver feed at specific times throughout the day in a set sequence. I was assessing fecal score, which is measured on a scale from one to five, one being very loose and five being very firm. This is a high producing group, so we aim for a score of at least 2.5, with three being ideal. If the feces are too loose, it indicates a need to adjust fiber in the diet. If too firm, it suggests we could offer a more nutrient dense diet. In either case, it's a key indicator of rumen health. This facility, although different from the free stall, shares a similar basic structure. Bedding, alley width, and feed bunk construction are similar. However, unlike the free stall, this barn does not have external fans or sprinkler systems. The roof is lower, intentionally designed to keep denser, cooler air where the cows are. There is a honeycomb cooling system at the top of the barn and an exhaust system near the bottom. Due to air pressure differentials outside the barn, the exhaust fans create negative pressure that forces air through the evaporative honeycomb, where it is cooled by water before circulating through the barn. This system is commonly known as a wind tunnel, as the cooled air flows from front to back, exiting through the rear exhaust fans. On hot days, the temperature difference between the outside and inside of the barn can reach 11 to 13 degrees Celsius. High-producing dairy cows generate substantial internal heat due to their intense metabolic activity. On average, for each one liter of milk produced, approximately 500 liters of blood circulate through the udder to deliver nutrients. Now imagine a cow producing 60 to 70 liters of milk per day. That's an extremely high blood flow rate and metabolic demand, resulting in substantial heat production. A cooled environment is essential for thermal comfort, enabling the cow to rest more comfortably and consequently to produce more milk. As I mentioned, this is a honeycomb cooling system. Water trickles through the honeycomb, and due to negative pressure, the incoming air is cooled and flows throughout the barn. Along the barn, we install canvas deflectors that help increase air velocity. Not only the volume of air, but also its speed, is critical for effective heat exchange. The recommended air speed is at least three meters per second. These deflectors narrow the air passage. Like when you pinch a hose to increase water pressure, the same principle applies to air, boosting its speed and improving cow comfort. 
For dairy cows, the ideal photo period is 16 hours of light and 8 hours of darkness. Since the barn is fully enclosed, we need consistent artificial lighting inside. At the cow's eye level when lying down, we aim for a minimum of 200 lux to simulate daylight and stimulate intake and activity. That's why the deflectors are installed lower. We measure light intensity, lux, exactly where the cows are lying. There are 200 beds on each side, and we maintain a stocking density of one animal per bed, a maximum of 100% occupancy. This setup increases the chances that cows spend more time lying down while in the barn. These are high-producing cows, and we divide the lactating herd into four categories. Immediate postpartum, up to 30 days after calving, which receives a specific diet, followed by high production, medium production, and low production diets. Milk production peaks between 90 and 110 days postpartum, then gradually declines over the lactation curve until the cow enters a dry period of 60 days before starting a new lactation cycle. We have two full-time hoof trimmers on the farm, working with a lift chute, not a tilt chute. These two technicians perform daily trimming. Preventive trimming is scheduled around 90 to 150 days in milk, dime, and again 60 days before calving, during the dry-off period. These are the key moments for hoof balance and weight distribution, minimizing pressure on specific hoof zones. Every 15 days, we conduct locomotion scoring using a 1 to 5 scale. Ideally, cows should be at score 1, up to 2 maximum. Any cow scoring above 3 is immediately referred for hoof trimming and intervention. The closer feed is pushed toward the cows, the more they consume. Our goal is to have the cows either eating or lying down. The feed push robot helps maximize intake. Once feed is distributed along the bunk, cows tend to push it forward while eating, since they are extremely selective. This displaces the feed. The robot travels the length of the barn every hour, guided by wall-mounted sensors, and returns autonomously to its charging station. Its function is to reposition the feed, ensuring optimal accessibility. We conduct weekly feed analyses of ingredients with greater variability. Corn silage, pre-dried grasses, and reconstituted grain. Key parameters in corn silage include starch content, which inversely correlates with NDF, and fiber digestibility. Our benchmarks for quality silage include starch above 30%, good fiber digestibility, and NDF digestibility, TTNDFD, over 40%. Here we have two high production pens, followed by postpartum cows and postpartum heifers, then two high production heifer pens, and two mid production cow pens, one of which is for cows with high somatic cell counts, SCC. At the far end is the low production group, consisting of cows in late lactation. Broadly speaking, the productive animals are housed on the right side, and all rearing areas are on the left. The dairy structural area covers 84 hectares. Surrounding that, we have feed production areas, including both irrigated land under central pivots and rain-fed fields. Our total agricultural land is around 730 hectares, of which 215 hectares are irrigated. The entire farm area is 2,100 hectares, plus 1,000 additional irrigated hectares. This includes all dairy facilities, feed production zones, beef cattle grazing, and citrus plantations. The diet includes byproducts such as citrus pulp from the orange juice industry, cotton seed from the textile industry, DDG, a byproduct of corn ethanol plants, and sugarcane bagasse from ethanol mills. This is phase two of the rearing program. At the back is phase one, the milk feeding phase. 
Calves remain there until around 82 or 83 days of age, after which they are weaned and grouped into sets of 10 animals. As they grow, they are regrouped into larger groups. This growth phase spans from 83 days to one year of age. They then transition to phase three, the reproductive phase, where they are inseminated and eventually move to maternity for calving. This is a compost barn system where we use peanut shells as bedding substrate. The animals are housed here during the growth phase. This diet is specific to heifers, with tifton hay as the fiber source, comprising 15% forage and 85% concentrate. Since these animals are still adapting, their diet is more nutrient-dense than that of adult cows, whose rations contain 50 to 60% concentrate.